Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Nick Thompson. You may know me from Netflix Love is Blind, but on this podcast, we sit down with guests from all walks of life to hear their stories, remove stigmas, and understand what makes them tick. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Conversations with Nick Thompson. I'm your host, Nick Thompson. And today, I'm very excited about the conversation that we're going to be having with Jim McCann, who is the founder and creator of 1-800-Flowers. I didn't even know some of the things about Jim that I found researching for this episode. He actually has a bachelor degree in psychology. He worked as a social worker. It's really interesting to see the way Jim foresaw the 1-800-Flowers business and saw that 1-800 numbers were going to be a very important part of our culture at the time, and that it would be a great way for people to call, order, and deliver flowers and smiles to people's faces. And then had the wherewithal to predict that the dot-com boom was going to happen and move 1-800-Flowers online so that people could order from anywhere. And so there's a lot of interesting things on his his business acumen side. But what I also want to dig into is how did he have all of this success and still maintain this empathy, this understanding, and this willingness to speak about complex topics? So I think in this time when it is very important to normalize talking about mental health, it's important that we have people like Jim on who have a voice, who have a platform and share their stories and then share their advocacy for a more open conversation around mental health and how we're all feeling. I haven't always been vocal about my feelings and my mental health. In fact, I spent a lot of time hiding it, not just from family and friends, but really from everyone. I went through, um, you know, a lot of tough things, at least for me, um, you know, throughout my life. And, and I've always kind of had this lingering feeling, but I didn't really know how to talk about it. To be honest, I didn't even know what it was for a long time. One of the interesting things about Jim is that even in his time now, he spends time talking about mental health on his social media. He talks about it on his podcast, Celebrations Chatter. He talks about everything from his own experiences to his experiences building his company and how he's continuing to advocate for it now. Talking to Jim is going to be really exciting. I'm going to ask him some questions about how he grew up. We'll get into some of the things that have impacted him and shaped the way that he thinks and feels. We'll get into his business experience and we'll talk a lot about mental health and how it should be talked about and normalized, including how he views relationships and their role into the human experience. So really excited for this. I hope you all enjoy it. Let's get right to that interview. We're going to go talk to Jim McCann. Founder, 1-800-Flowers. Today, we have a very special guest with us. I have Jim McCann. He's the founder of 1-800-Flowers, the author of a variety of different books, host of the Celebrations Chatter podcast, where he's forward sharing his learnings with special guests. And additionally, one of the things I think is really great is Jim has worked as a social worker. He continues to be a much needed voice for mental health and for mental health advocacy, but most importantly, and I found this on your LinkedIn, you love delivering smiles to faces. So Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Oh, Nick, nice to be with you today. We'll start off today with small talk questions of the day, just to get to know you, break the ice a little bit. Does that sound good? Sure does. All right. So we'll start off with what's your favorite vacation that you've ever been on? I would say uh, it's not an away vacation. It's a staycation. So we live on Long Island, uh, near into the city but we have a summer home on the east end of Long Island. And uh, the greatest times for me, when I think of vacation, it's summertime. And it's when I, I, we have, my wife and I, uh, Mary Lou, have uh, three grown kids and seven grandkids, more and more. Oh, wow. And it's when we all get together. And I think the, the, all, the last time we were all together, non-holiday, was the end of last summer. And everybody, so all three kids, their spouses and the... Uh, and the seven grandkids were out at the uh, beach house. And uh, I, I, the weekend was fun. The weather was beautiful. We're out on the boats. We're water skiing. We're jet skiing. And then the last night, everybody chips in. And we make this grand dinner. And uh, one of the great investments we made during COVID, Nick, was we bought a, a pizza oven for outdoors. So we had this beautiful barbecue area looking out over the water. And 
everybody with the pizza oven, all the kids get involved in cooking. So it, it used to be that the adults cooked and the kids didn't. And now the kids are in the kitchen too and they're cutting and they're dicing and they're throwing the flour around and making pizza becomes of course a contest. I and uh, so I, the, my knee jerk when he asked that question is, that was a great long holiday weekend and it finished up with the best dinner of the summer with all of us just sitting around the table, having good laughs, dogs running everywhere and uh, smiles were, were, were on every face. That's perfect. And next time I want to come, cause I'm a huge pizza fan. I love making them homemade too. <laughs> oh, so you want to get into competition to see if your pizza is best. <laughs> exactly. I'm very competitive too. <laughs> <laughs> what town oh, sorry. in Chicago did you grow up in? So I grew up in a small town called um, Schomburg or Rolling Meadows. If you're really in the area, it's about yeah. 25 miles outside of Chicago. So, you know, anywhere, if you've ever driven in Chicago, 30 minutes, two and a half hour drive, depends on the time of day you're going. It sure does. Yeah. And of course, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Highland Park experienced a, a tragedy of tragedies, huh? Yeah, it was awful. I have um, quite a few friends that live out there and it was nerve wracking to yeah. reach out and they had small kids too. So they would be at a, a parade like that. And yeah. ironically, not too ironic. I have a, a friends and their young child and they're about to expect their, their second one moved to Highland Park out of Chicago to get away from the crime. Yeah. And then that well, it's such a, a nice town. All those suburban towns there are so nice and they have real feel of uh, patriotism and uh, embrace of Americana. And here was a classic 4th of July parade. It was just a, just a shame. Yeah. And I hope, I hope those people uh, get the help they need because they're gonna need help. And I hope they recover quickly because the town deserves it. I agree with you. And if you've ever been to Highland Park, it's a beautiful town too. It's I have, just... it's been a wonderful walk around place. You know. Yeah, uh, we own a, a, a at one eight hundred flowers. We have other gifting companies, and we own one out in Lake Forest, which is called the Popcorn Factory. And we I'm used to own there. Fannie Mae Fannie Mae chocolates, and we had a store there in Highland Park, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with it. And uh, and then we have a big facility in Melrose Park where we uh, design, source all the ingredients and make all of our gift baskets uh, for one oh. eight hundred flowers for one eight hundred baskets. And for another one of our brands, uh, Harry and David. So we oh, have that's awesome. lots of Chicago presence. I love that. Chicago actually just got voted the second best city to live in in the world. I don't know if you saw that. I Came did not yesterday. That. Apparently yeah. they don't include weather as one of the criteria. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we've got three months of amazing weather in Chicago and that <laughs> is it. But not in a row. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you pay for it with extreme hot in the middle and then freezing cold on both sides of it. <laughs> you know, Nick, uh, being a lifelong New Yorker, uh, it seems to me that New York's about six or eight degrees cooler in the summer than Chicago, uh, and about uh, six or eight degrees warmer than Chicago in the winter time. I guess it's the ocean moderating influence. Oh, that could be, I didn't know that. That's very interesting. I've been to, um, I've been to New York. When, would I, when did I go? It was like fall. So it was just kind of like 60s maybe yep. 50s yeah pretty perfect <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> what is your favorite movie and why i guess uh, godfather 2 <laughs> uh it's just it, it's something you can watch i was just chatting with a friend over the weekend and we were talking about favorite movies and we were talking about a movie that we both like that a lot of people haven't seen called once upon a time in america uh michael Cimino film beautiful film uh, again, the, the wise guy theme, but it was like a three and a half hour long movie. And then we got around to favorites. And I think his favorite, certainly top five for him as well was Godfather 2. And it's, we both said it's one of those things like late on a Saturday afternoon in the fall or winter time. Uh, and all of a sudden you turn the TV on to go look for your favorite sport and you cross, uh, cross channels and see the Godfather playing. You can't help but watch 15 minutes of it on a late oh, Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those very rare sequels that is the best in the franchise too, which is Very amazing. rare that that happens. Yeah. You know? And of course, I think the best is when they took all three of those movies and spliced them together sequentially. That was pretty well done. Yeah, that's a, that's a long day. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a winter Saturday. 
yeah. in Chicago. We have a lot of snow coming down. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and you so tell me a, a little bit about your life now. You, you've, uh, uh, you've all of a sudden become a, a quite well known, so you've achieved some celebrity. Uh, how does that square with your day job and how are you integrating these things? And uh, obviously it's had a, a profound impact on your social life. Uh, your, yeah. your personal life. It's, uh, how, do you, how are you blending all of this now? I'm learning as I go. I am a VP in software marketing. So I have a pretty intense and extensive role. Um, so for me, it's been making sure I can still do that. And, and I like doing it, making sure that I can give that the attention, but also be able to sort of develop this new podcast and take advantage of having this platform to talk about things that are important to me um, and important to, to both of us, actually. I'm very naive and I didn't realize how much popularity the show had or how much people would recognize me, um, including work. So I told HR and my boss like a week before they announced the cast, and I said, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. And then they were like, okay, well, would you like to tell the company? I'm like, nah, they, there's a couple that'll probably see it and reach out. <laughs> and then the trailer comes out and I, I get in a one-on-one -on -one with our CEO. And he's like, so I saw the trailer for Love is Blind season two and you're on it. And I know you're married. And so he just kind of like put it all together. And it was, it was pretty funny because then everyone everyone knows like the yes. whole company knows do you have siblings i do i have two sisters that are uh two and three years younger than me and and what how has that influenced the family dynamic so it's been it's been weird it was much weirder coming back uh because you you take three weeks off of work and technology and you go and you film and there's a chance you're gone in a day or two and there's a chance you go seven weeks and get married. And that's yep. what I did. So I had told my sisters, um, I remember because they picked me up, it was Easter Sunday. And I was leaving in like a week or two. And I told them in the car on the way back, and it was just the three of us. And I said, don't tell mom and dad, because they would not approve. It's impossible to ask them to do that. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. So when I got back, wow. and they're like, where's Nick been for three weeks? And and they said I was on a yoga retreat, which is something I would do. And then more or less, it was just that and get back. And I was terrified to tell my dad. And I, I called my mom who had started to put something together. Um, and I made my sisters hop on the call too, because I was scared. You needed help. I need a buffer. <laughs> you called for a helpline. <laughs> exactly. 1-800, I need help, please. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect the people at work are treating you a little differently now, huh? I don't think they mean to troll me, but I feel trolled. Like, I feel like they're, they're, they're not really mocking me, but like, I never thought I would do something like this. So when they kind of joke about it or say something about it, it's, I take it probably in a different way, but they've been so supportive of it. Um, and so accommodating and understanding and, and so it's been, it's, they're, they're, everyone's very nice. Like I happen to work at a great company where the people are wonderful too. You know, I think there's a, a lesson in there and I'm willing to bet or certainly guess uh, that the reaction you get from people is so much about your attitude. If you were defensive or had a little bit of a chip on your shoulder about them kidding you about it, your attitude is going to make such a difference in terms of how they react and that, that quick initial interaction and your response is going to flavor and influence how, how people think about you and go forward. So I would suspect your good roll with it, smile, humble uh, uh, approach to things is having a big impact on how people react to you and, and treat you. I think you're right. I appreciate you saying that. I, I remember they thought it was awesome that I, I realized they had a Slack channel where they talk about reality TV and there was full conversations going on <laughs> while this was on. And so I hopped in there after I found out about it and just went in there and started like, all right, hit me with your questions. Elephants out of the room. Let's call it out. <laughs> I see that you're self-deprecating too. So you're willing to, you're willing to be the brunt of the joke uh, as long as it's in good fun. 
Exactly. I, I say I'm a D minus list celebrity. So <laughs> <laughs> I might add that to my social media profiles. <laughs> So let me let me ask you this this last uh, this last question. I'm dying to ask you before I I ask you maybe something more serious. What is your favorite flower? I've been in the floral business for over 40 years now, uh, Nick. And during that time, the availability and the quality and the quantity of flowers has matured so much. So when, you know, I in 40 plus years ago, you know, we only had the basics other than seasonal availability. And now because we import flowers from all over the world, we have such a beautiful variety and the quality is so much better that it's hard to have just one favorite. But so I give you two answers. On a seasonal basis, it's uh, a peony. Uh, they're only around for a few weeks. We have an extended season because we can source them from a lot of different climates. But at the end of the day, we at the very beginning of my career, we had roses, uh, red roses, and they weren't the greatest and uh, yellow and white, once in a while, a pink. And now we have literally a couple of hundred different color roses, all different varieties. So uh, as, was meant, uh, as was mentioned by a woman a long time ago, a rose is a rose is a rose. And I just, I love flowers now. And uh, you know, I did it before I got into the business. And I like to have flowers around the house. I like to do them myself. And I like a single variety at a time. So I'll, I, I'd like a, a bouquet of Alstrom area in our, in our uh, home or a, a couple of dozen roses in a vase. I like to arrange it myself. I don't even like to put other filler or, or greens with them. I just like a beautiful flower in a clear glass vase. And I, I especially love uh, getting a, a, a nice new variety of roses. I actually used to work at uh, Jewel Osco, which is a grocery store here. And sure, my no, favorite well, thing to do would be to go help out in the floral department so I could build bouquets. <laughs> I just, there was an article that came out uh, last week that my brother Chris, who's the, our CEO now at Flowers, my younger brother Chris, and he sent me an article uh, about why supermarkets have flowers in the front of the supermarket. And uh, it's chemically measurable that people's attitude when they walk through those floral departments, whether they make a purchase or not, it elevates their mood and in a very positive direction and it, uh, in, it releases uh, dopamine. Mm. So now as they walk through the floral department, as they approach the rest of the store, they're in a better mood just for having walked through. That is genius. And that's probably why all of these grocery stores or big box stores have the floral department right at the front of the store. It, indeed. <laughs> Um, so you you mentioned a, a second ago that you didn't always love flowers. So how did this happen? How did that become you know such a defining part of your personality and legacy? Uh, an accident, as you uh, mentioned in your kind introduction. My first, I had lots of jobs. So, you know, I was a, my dad was a painting contractor. We grew up in Queens, New York, very 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 blue collar kind of community. And so you you grow up working for your dad, you know, in the painting business. So you do all those uh, dirty jobs that the men wouldn't do. Uh, and I was dying to get out of that business. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, being an Irish Catholic kid from South Queens, I had a genetic requirement to be a bartender several times. And, uh, uh, and then I found this job uh, as a result of my first bartending gig. I found this opportunity to work in a group home for teenage boys. A friend of mine ran it. Mm. I, I was tending bar. He was a customer. And... Uh, he'd tell me about it all the time. And he finally said, you know, you seem very curious about this work. He said, why don't you come have dinner with me one night in a group home, meet the boys. Mm. So I did. And uh, that night he said to me, uh, after dinner, we went down to his office in the basement level. And he said, do you think you'd ever like to give this work a try? And I said, you know, I, I think I would. So he flipped me the keys and said, good, because I'm in a hole here. I need coverage tonight. Uh, I have to get going. There's no one. Here. So you're on duty now. And so being on duty was, I, I stayed there for the rest of the evening, got the kids to bed, went to bed myself. I had a, a room in the, in the, on the first floor of the group home, it was a two-story, well, three-story house uh, with a you know, raised basement and 10 boys. And my job is to get them up, get them out to school in the morning. And then uh, Bob, uh, the manager, the, the, group, uh, the group home manager would come back during the day. Uh, 
And I did that that first night. And that was an accident that started their, their career. And it was wonderful. I loved it. I, I wasn't that good at it, but I learned to be good because I had right. good mentors, and good role models to mimic. And I loved the experience. I mean, here I am. I was just week, months older than the oldest boy in the group home. I was 21 years old. Oh, wow. And it was a, a great experience. So I lived in that group home uh, for a year. And then I ran another group home. And, and I learned so much about myself interacting with. I became my father at 21. <laughs> All the things You're supposed to wait till I later to do that. To say, I'm saying, I'm, you know. <laughs> but I really, really did care about these guys and I really did learn so much about myself and about group dynamics and about uh, building relationships and that's when I learned that the whole world as you know so well is all about relationships we measure our success our happiness uh, our physical health our mental health based on the number and depth and breadth of relationships we have uh, I've never met anyone anyone who said, I have way too many people who love me in my life. Uh, I have way too many good relationships. I've never heard it. I never will. Were you already working in the psychology area in your schooling or was this? I was, a, I was a psychology major in college. Uh, I went to a college, thought I'd be a policeman. So I went to a college okay. in New York City called John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I started while I was in school working this job. And I decided to defer my uh, going to the police academy because I was enjoying so much what I did. Mm -hmm. And then I became successful at the home. I became the administrator at a very young age. Uh, uh, and I then never went into the police department. So I was studying psychology and, and, uh, and uh, so the, yeah, I got my degree there. Then uh, uh, I married very young. Uh, Mary Lou and I started a family very young. And that narrows your choices in terms mm. of risk you can take. And uh, so uh, working in the not-for-profit social work world, I learned that you don't make money, <laughs> which is why I get, that. <laughs> get promoted so easily and quickly because uh, no one else would do it. So I was always supplementing my income. Uh, now I'm now the, now the administrator, so it's not 24 seven like it was when I was living in or running the group homes. And uh, I got a job tending bar again on the Upper East Side of New York on Friday and Saturday nights, twirling bottles. And uh, a new friend there that I met owned the flower shop across the street. And I was always thinking, okay, how do I find a business to get into? I didn't want to be in the painting business. I had already decided not to uh, become a policeman. I knew the social work career was great and rewarding, but not monetarily. And so I was looking for the next adventure. And this customer of mine in New York City owned the flower shop of Curse Street. And I thought, well, back in South Queens, there's a guy that had seen quite successful, had a big flower shop at the main intersection in our area of town. And he seemed to be quite successful. And seemed to, so I went to work there a couple of Saturday afternoons before I went to work at the bar. And uh, I said, yeah, Nick, I like this world and I'm, I'm going to buy the bar, uh, buy the, uh, buy the uh, flower shop. And I bought it with the idea of making it a business, Nick. So not just being a florist, which of course right. I can. But uh, so I kept my full-time job running St. John's Home for Boys for another eight plus years, so I could take everything I uh, made in the flower shops and open more shops. And so every six months I'd open another shop, then every three months, then I was on the, down full-time in the flower business, <laughs> and I have all these flower shops, thirty or forty of them, and I realized, oh my goodness, there's no economy of scale here in owning all these shops. And that's when we decided to uh, change our name to 1-800-Flowers and, and go about growing our business in a different way. So I did it as a business, but I learned to be a florist and I fell in love with the product and the role we play in people's lives. I think that is so inspiring to hear that you found your passion and were able to do it, looking for a way to essentially take care of your family. That was it. I, yeah. no, uh, no great aspirations there other than to try and be successful. And because I wasn't a great student and I had a career path of not being in business, I didn't have the business skills, but you pick them up along the way when you're writing the checks. Yeah, and that, that's another thing I wanted to ask you about. So you have this, this psychology, social work, obviously you were giving to your community, even if you were being paid very little for it. 
How did you bring that into being a CEO of a company that eventually grew into be 1-800-Flowers and then 1-800-Flowers.com? Nick, uh, the secret for me was the, the skills I needed to develop uh, running a group home, keeping kids out of trouble. Well, how did you do, how did you keep kids out of trouble? At first, I didn't realize it, but the best way to do it was come to work with a plan. If I came to work and just sat around waiting for things to happen and reacted to them, I was a busy dude dealing with police, trouble in the community. We were in a very tough community. And I learned from some really thoughtful, caring, good people who were in that work a long time, uh, who took me under their wing, that the most successful people in that work cared about the kids a lot, worked a lot more than they were required to, like all the time. And they had a plan. And they did everything they could to establish a relationship with each boy. At the beginning, I tried to have a relationship with the group. You don't have relationships with groups. No. You have relationships. With, so I had to find a way to break through with each guy and have our level of relationship. So right. and some would be very deep and, and, and personal. Some would surrender to it. Others, I never, you know, as I didn't have them all for a long, long time. There was some turnover. Uh, and some I never really developed a close relationship with, but I wanted to know, them to know that I really did care about them mm -hmm. and that they could be safe with me. And then I learned that it was really important that I set the rules and stick to them. And then coming to work with a plan. If we came to work and we were going to build something, we were going to build a new storage unit in the basement so that when we went grocery shopping, the cabinets wouldn't be looted in an hour. <laughs> Uh, that uh, we were going to have a, a, a storage closet downstairs where our house mother could uh, have a key and budget out the supplies for the week. That was a real learning experience because now we're dealing with what, Nick? Power tools. Yeah. And oh. what gets a teenage boy interested? Power tools. Yeah, so scary you too. Had to, you had to win uh, the opportunity to work on this project. And not everybody worked on it. So I had to find things, okay, these three guys are really into this. How are we going to plan it? What kind of lumber are we going to need? What kind of tools? How long is this going to take? And then uh, another, oh, I remember one guy, beautiful springtime. Uh, we had a this two and a half story house in this tough neighborhood. And we had a backyard where we park our, our car for the group home, station wagon. Back then there were station wagons. And, uh, and it had a dirt patch, but nothing ever grew there. And we decided, okay, I'm going to park the car out front and I'm going to try and grow a garden here. And lo and behold, a couple of guys really got interested. We're growing lettuce, bib lettuce, Boston oh, wow. lettuce. We're growing tomatoes. And I got a couple of guys. So I got three guys who were really interested in the storage cabinet. I got two other guys who were putting a little fence with a chain link in the front of the house so people don't tramp on this new grass we just planted which was about 15 by 15. Uh, we got two guys who are really into the garden. So if I said, come to the office next and we're gonna have a counseling session, mm -hmm. they did present me with the Center Digit Award. Uh, but if we're out working in the garden together and we start talking about the fact that Norman wants to ask this girl out, but he's not sure how we talk about it, it's not a counseling session, we're working in the garden together. Right. So it's founding a way to build bridges and relationships that were different. And I tell you that because organizing them into groups, helping them to achieve things that they never thought they could achieve, mm -hmm. setting goals, uh, setting interim recognition points, keeping score, making it fun. Well, guess what? That's what you do at work every day. Motivate it's what I've done people. at work every day. It's the same thing with a different audience. Now, my audience at work here doesn't have knives and guns on them all the time like my kids had. <laughs> Right. Well, not all the time anyway, but it really is the same thing. Organizing people, connecting with them, giving them a goal, cheering for them along the way, keeping score, making it fun, making it corny fun, and having a bigger purpose in terms of knowing that the things we do really do impact people's ability to have interesting and positive relationships in their life. Now, we do it primarily with gifts. But more and more, we're expanding our services beyond transactions uh, in, in terms of uh, our gifts right. uh, to other services we can offer that don't result in a transaction, but serve our relationship right. with our, our consumers. 
So you really take this building connections. You've built an entire industry from it. You kind of learned it through this social working experience, but you're leading those young folks in a direction by motivating them and understanding what makes them tick essentially and guiding them. Well, well, I think we come to it with an assumption that we know what makes us tick. Mm -hmm. And it's this need, this craving we all have to have relationships. And to see the unique way that you found your life partner, your spouse, I mean, it's just, it captures everybody's attention. And people are enamored with the fact that you become a celebrity and you're such a nice and humble person. And, but they're all saying, hey, could I have had the nerve to do that? And would I, would I have behaved in the same way? But our intentions are all the same. You're sincerely interested in the people's well-being and their mental health. And I remember reading an article in the Wall Street Journal, I would say three and a half, four, four years ago now, where, and the title was The Loneliest Generation, Baby Boomers. And these two thoughtful young editors for the Wall Street Journal did an exhaustive piece, a little bit on the front page, two big full pages inside. And it said, my generation, baby boomers, were the loneliest generation. And mm-hmm. what they suggested was, we're the loneliest because we're the first generation in large numbers to move away from where we grew up, so not have the support of family mm-hmm. infrastructure, yeah. to live past Social Security age, which our parents did not. So Social Security age, when it was set by Roosevelt in the 40s, I guess, yeah. was set at uh, 65 because the life expectancy at that time was 62. Now it's 83 and 84. That. So we're living longer, but we developed a, a real embrace of uh, diabetes because of our lifestyles, lack of activity, poor yeah. diets. So we're the first generation to have diabetes in great numbers, first generation to divorce in great numbers. So now you have people who moved away from home, don't have the family infrastructure of of multi-generational support system, like you would have seen around the suburbs of Chicago a lot. And uh, they might not be in the best health. And uh, now they're outlived their money because they're living longer. And they have physical problems because of diabetes. So they're alone, disconnected, broken, maybe estranged from the family because of a divorce. Well, that's mm-hmm. a heck of a mm-hmm. formula for loneliness. Yeah. Now, your generation and the younger generations are competing to be even lonelier than we are, which is so ironic at a time when we have this wonderful uh, array of social media tools available to us. The inverse, which I never would have anticipated, is that people assume that what they see online, which is a perfect life, is actually someone else's life and not theirs. And it's yeah. making them lonely as hell. You know, so you have uh, Generation Z and, uh, and millennials, millennials saying 20%, 7% of millennials say they don't have a close friend. 22% of Generation Z say they never had a friend. And that's that is so just frightening and alarming. Jeez. And when we talk about depressing things like we did earlier about Highland Park, it's no wonder. It's no wonder. I guess maybe this is a, a good spot to, to end on that. So, and maybe it'll be a little happier than, and less sad, but w- you've built business, you've built your life, your extracurricular activities in a lot of ways around these human connections. It's what inspires you. It and is. you've used in a sense with the beginning, you used human to human connection then you were able to build human connections using technology. And now we're in a generation where we are increasingly using technology to communicate, whether that's text message, Zoom calls, video message in some cases. What type of advice or what type of direction would you like to see humans, our young people, millennials like myself, Gen Z, who are lacking these connections and then feeling lonely. What advice do you have or what do you think could happen to help turn that around? There's two things. One is a question. Were you shy as a kid? I was, but I would warm up. But at Mm -hmm. first, yes, very much so. Well, advice I give to my kids and to other young people I, I have relationships with 
is uh, my kids were, were shy. I'm a recovering shy person. <laughs> uh, I went to work in retail as a kid and that was the best thing that could happen to me therapeutically because if this I wanted to eat, I had to wait on people and sell. And it taught me, and working around older guys who uh, were salespeople, taught me how to use humor mm -hmm. and uh, risk, take the risk. So when someone says, uh, have a nice day in the office, and I say, don't tell me what to do, and it startles <laughs> them. And they realize I'm kidding, and all of a sudden, our relationship quickly jumps to another level. I realized that there was, there was a benefit to taking the risk of doing something that could be taken the wrong way, but was done with good intention. So right. my advice to my kids were, when you walk into a room, it's the first day of class, it's a cocktail party uh, at the office, and you walk in, you don't know anybody else in the room, you're feeling uncomfortable, you're feeling out of sorts, shy, look for the other person in the room who's clearly suffering, clearly having the same issue as you, and get your bravery on, put your big boy pants on, and walk over, say hello to them, crack a joke, because you're there to help them. Right. And if you help them, you're not thinking about how it's helping you. So I tell them, make believe you're the host. Because if you're having a friends over your house at a party, your eyes are darting around all the time. Is everybody in a good right. conversation? Yep. Everyone it's very stressful. Cool? Is someone out of sorts? They're off by themselves. How do I get them into a conversation? And if you approach social and business situations with a host mentality, you'll be helping yourself without realizing it and doing something nice for somebody else. Advice number one. Number two, on a grander, more proactive scale, I, I just had an occasion to... Uh, be the commencement speaker, speaker at a college here in New York called Manhattan College. Wonderful, wonderful school. And my advice to those, uh, those graduates was, just like you had a plan to get here today, to graduate, uh, just like uh, you had to structure your time and have different uh, aspects of your plan to get to this finish line, you should start every year with the same objective, only in terms of your relationship plan. It should be a real plan. Just like we make New Year's resolutions, we should develop a plan that how are we gonna have more and better relationships in our life? Which relationships did we have that have waned uh, that we wanna reinvest in, rekindle? And which relationships don't we have that we've always dreamed about and how are we gonna go about trying to form those? And I think it should be a written plan. Who do you wanna stay connected to? And have your plan, how are you going to do it? So it could be, I read, I read a, a really interesting article about uh, Nick Thompson <laughs> in uh, The Hollywood Reporter at, uh, five weeks from now. And I, send, I can text you a copy of it uh, and say, hey, read this article about you. Glad to see you got uh, that recognition that you deserve. Congratulations. It's part of my plan to stay connected with you so that I have more and better relationships in my life. And it's from a real plan. So that's the biggest piece of advice I can give. Some people fall out of bed in the morning and they have a hundred new friends. That's not me. Uh, it may be you at this point in your life. It's not, well, it might be me now, yeah. I have probably a, a half a dozen to 10 friends who are my COVID buddies. That is, mm -hmm. we became friends at the beginning of COVID and we've never met in person. But I genuinely feel that like wild? Different. How about for you? Yeah, absolutely. I have, um, I would say like coworkers that became friends yes. where you build this entire relationship and this entire bond and it's digital. And what's funny is people meet me for the first time and they're like, whoa, you're tall. I'm six, five. They don't know that. <laughs> you sure. Or the way it's funny. My, my manager was talking about me we met for the first time two or three weeks ago now and he's like when you type he's like you peck you don't use home row and I'm like <laughs> yeah that's like a random thing you would never know because we've never met and worked together so yep. I think that those are the those connections and then when you have them in person I think it only makes them better but when you met how did you meet your friends well uh, one fellow I'm thinking of earliest on in COVID his name is George Everly Dr. George Everly, he's a psychologist of great renown. 
Mm. And he teaches, uh, he lives in Baltimore. He teaches at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's in the uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he wrote an article in Psychology Today that a friend of mine forwarded to me and said, I thought you'd find this interesting. And I was blown away by it. It's it's about these subjects, about the importance of relationships. And he's an expert on PTSD. Mm -hmm. So big cataclysmic events. He researched the bombings of London during World War II and the impact it had on the population. And I found the article that he wrote in Psychology Today to be brilliant. So I wrote him a fan letter. I said, Dr. Reveille, I, I read this. I've shared it now with 50 people. I think it's just brilliant. And I said, I hope someday we have occasion to meet and chat. And he wrote back. He said, well, I know who you are, but why would you want to chat with me? I said, well, why don't we give it a try? And just uh, Thursday of last week, I was so flattered because he's brilliant. He's written 28 books. He's the most extraordinary guy. All the different things he's done in life. And he asked me if we could do a book together on a subject that's of great interest to me. And just last Thursday, we agreed to do that together. And oh, we've wow. never met in person. And now you're going to be partners on a book. Indeed, we are. And I'm so looking forward to the work that we'll do to write it, because it will give me an excuse to interact with him a whole lot. Right. What's your book topic going to be? Well, uh, it's, what we're looking at is he wrote a book 40 years ago about uh about uh, how to handle uh, people in crisis. And he's of the strong opinion that people who are non-professionals in the, in the clinical fields mm-hmm. can be armed with tools to help people in a moment of crisis. Uh, EMTs, police officers, right. he's been doing this work. And he wrote the definitive book that's still in print 40 years later. And he wants to do that now. And so what we're gonna look at, Love that. we're gonna look at all the different books that have been written about self-motivation, success, and we're going to distill it down to what we think are the pillars of all of those books. We don't know how many it's going to be. We're in the process of doing the work now. And then we're going to relate it with our own anecdotes, our own stories, our own lessons from other people. And he'll come back with the underpinnings from a real psychological and clinical point of view. So we don't know where it's going to take us, but we're committed to go down that path. Because as, as, as I think you're a living example, attitude matters. You can continue to learn lessons your whole life mm-hmm. and, uh, and you can learn from other people. And there's some co- common tenets that you live in and, uh, and evidence every day of your approach to life, your plan for life uh, is all the determinants about how you feel, your right. mental, your physical health and your feelings of success and contentment. So we wanna do a, a bunch of, bunch of re- research and work on that. I think that's amazing. And the one thing, and this is a little bit of a sidestep, perhaps, but you mentioned it when I listen to um, a couple episodes of your podcast, and I hear you talk about really how you want to foster, obviously, relationships, but share your learning. This fits right in there, right? Lessons you've learned throughout your life. And it's right over the heart of the plate. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. I usually at this point, you've asked the whole time, but was going to say, are there any additional questions, let's say, that you wanted to ask me before we uh, we give give you the floor to say some final words? Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, I would imagine committing to go on that show was a radical step for you. There was an event in history called Watergate. And that's where a a few uh, uh, political operatives broke into the Democratic National Headquarters to get some intel. And one of them was a character by the name of G. Gordon Liddy, since passed, but he went on to some infamy uh, and then fame after that episode and uh, had a radio program and wrote some books. And I, listening to him, I was impressed by him. And he said that the greatest lesson he learned was to attack your fears. And he gave some examples. Uh, He had a terrible fear of rats. And so he one time caught a rat, cooked it, barbecued it, and ate it. And I remember I went reading his book then. I, I was married then uh, early. We had uh, two children. And the burden of that was really uh, having an impact on me. And I grew up in the glide path of JFK Airport in Queens. So I was always interested in aviation. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I developed a fear of flying. And having read G. Gordon Liddy's book, we were upstate one time and I went to a nearby airport 
where there were, had a, a few planes. One of them was a biplane and it had a grass runway. And I paid this fellow a few bucks to take me up and scare the heck out of me. And I did that <laughs> in an effort to overcome my fear of flying. And I did. Good for that, you. That was part of the process. And I, I love aviation now. But it seems to me that that's the bravery uh, that you committed to there was to go right up against a big fear of yours and look at the rewards that have come from that. That's a very good point. I'm also scared of rats. I won't be able to catch a quick <laughs> one, but you it's know, not on the menu, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, the funny thing is, is I did overcome quite a lot of fears doing this. And the interesting thing is, is I grew up wanting to be a filmmaker and wanting to be on the other side of the camera. And that's kind of, you mentioned earlier, the self-deprecation comes in because it's like, I always thought I was going to be famous for my ideas or being president or being a filmmaker or something. And I'm famous for a reality TV show. And so it's far. so far. And that's a humbling experience. Yeah. And I have to laugh at it. But, but it, it, has it further whet your appetite to go do things and, and knock off things on your checklist? Absolutely. And I think marrying Danielle the way that we did and being in that situation, knowing that the whole world's going to see the relationship and I'm a, I'm a private person too. And there was this, this whole realization because they interview you like every day after you film, like individually. <laughs> and I kept saying things like, I'm a private person. I'm a, and they're like, you're on a worldwide reality show. You are no longer a private person. Stop saying that. And I remember that because that was the realization that I was like, oh, wow. Boy, there's a real reward for confronting your fears. And you're the living example of it. That's a really great point. And they build on each other because once you conquer one, the others are just Where's another notch one? of the belt. Bring it on. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, it's been a treat to get to know you, Nick. And, uh, it and has. Learn about uh, this young punk and all the interesting things he's doing. I suspect uh, <laughs> that when we chat over the years, you'll be just putting a whole bunch of check marks on that long list of things you want to do in life. Well, I appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you. Is there anything final you want to say? Anything you want to plug? You want to plug your podcast, your your books, anything? Well, I'll look forward to sharing uh, parts of our conversation today on our podcast, which is called Celebrations Absolutely. Chatter. And Nick, uh, we have a wonderful audience. It's, uh, you know, as I get older, I just get more and more anxious if there's more and more I want to do. And if you focus on the things that are fun and meaningful in life, you never, you know, the, the old uh, contrite expression, you never work a day. That's exactly how I feel. So. How lucky are you? Awesome. How lucky am I? And how lucky am I that I got to meet you? I feel the same way. When I heard that you were um, working with with the team here and and would be willing, I was you were the ner one I was nervous about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope we get to meet in person very soon. That would be outstanding. If you're ever in Chicago, just let me know. We'll be there soon. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Conversations with Nick Thompson. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to follow us and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Links can be found in the description below, and we can't wait to see you next time.